Today we're going to start part four of Project X Hall. If you're not familiar with this project and this build, I have a playlist for it and you can follow along from the beginning. This truck is a 2005 GMC C5500, 8.1 gas, Allison Automatic. It was a former U Haul truck. Hence the name X-Hall. Used to be a 26-foot box truck we bought as a cabin chassis, took it all apart, cleaned everything up, primed and painted it, made some modifications, reassembled. We did some repairs, fixed some electrical, and now we're getting to the home stretch of this project. The ideal purpose would be a 10-foot dump, 10-foot flatbed, gooseneck, fifth wheel, something along those lines. But what good is a truck if it doesn't have a hitch? So in today's video, what we're going to do is we are going to create a hitch out of this piece of half-inch plate. If you'd like to see how that's done, stick around. I'm J.C. Smith, and I will show you how I'm going to do it. So there's several ways to go about putting this hitch plate on. The fastest, easiest way is going to be to take that plate and just put it on the back of this frame. And then V-groove this frame, weld the outside, and then come on the inside and then weld it here and do the same thing on both sides. That's the easiest, that's the fastest, and based on the GVW of this truck, the capacity of what it can tow, probably more than adequate. Then there's the other way, which is the way I prefer. I prefer to cut the plate so it slides inside the frame rail. I don't need it to go in very far. I just want it to go in far enough that I can lay a weld here and then put, have the plate and then lay a weld on the inside. I like the fact that it's, it spreads that weld, staggers it, instead of having the plate here, the frame ground, and a weld here and a weld here. Does it matter? I don't know. Do I like it? Yeah, most definitely. So I'm gonna lay it out that way. The difference is this is 34 inches about to the outside. The plate's 34 inches. Well, obviously it's too wide. So what I have to do, is measure the width inside the frame here and transfer that to here. So seeing how mine's already got the corners lopped off, I am, I'm using working off the center line because I don't want, if I end up leaving this cut like this, I don't want it offset to where, you know, it looks weird. What I've done is come off my center line and I've taken my distance between the two frame rails, divided by two and made my marks here and here. Once I've done that, I could measure all of this out to make it what we need, or you can do what I did. This is just a piece of the other frame we cut off. Just got a sliver, and I can just lay it up here. I'm gonna lay it right here to where it's sitting on the top right there, and I'm lined up here with my line, and I'll just trace this out. And then I'll just repeat that same thing on this side. And we'll just cut these notches out. That way it slides inside the frame. And that allows me to also bring some edge banding, which will take plate steel here. We're going to come up and we're going to make this bend and come up this way. And we're going to bolt it through the side as well. I don't need this to come in very far, but I would like it to be inside. So next thing we need to do is get this cut so we can get ready to slide it in. So we're using the Milwaukee M18 metal saw. That'll do. Yeah, that's close enough. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Because this, this leg right here is a little bit longer than that one, if you watch. Yep, I'm good with that. All right, let's do the other side. Yeah, that'll work. 
So after a little bit of flap disc work, it's it's uh, it's okay. It'll work. So now, uh, this is what I was talking about. You can see that we're too a little bit too wide here. Uh, if we bring our strapping up, our strapping is going to have to be pulled in. So I want to run a straight line down here and scribe that. And then uh, same thing on this side so that our strapping can come right up the side of this. And I want it wide enough that we can drill holes into the frame. We would like to have this weld all the way around as well as that strapping onto here. And that will help keep this. That's, that's the purpose of that strapping. So it's not doing this once we get down here. It will definitely help. Boy, ain't much off, is it, on that side? This is a scrap piece of uh, half inch, I think. Yeah, half inch by four. So that's what we're going to use for our strapping. It happens to be 36 and, or 38 and a half, I think, somewhere around there. So we're just going to cut it in half, and then hopefully that's long enough after we put a bend in it. Because if you take this material and you're going to make a bend in it, we're going to use up a little bit of our length. So hopefully there's enough. It'll be close enough, that's for sure. A lot of you guys know I've had this saw for geez a couple years now and uh, if you pay attention here this is the factory evolution blade that came on it I've never changed the blade and I have used used that thing more than I care to think about it's a very good saw works out very well if you don't if you do any fabrication work and you don't have one of these man you don't know what you are missing Right, so I'm going to put this half inch plate here and then I'm going to offset it out this way just enough to get a, a nice bead of weld in here and then I need to get this to come up this way and whatever whatever this is out this way whatever I decide half inch three eighths whatever that's how far this plate will come in and then these two will come together like this and at that point I could grind a V into here and then you know, run a weld up here as well. How do we want to make that transition? There's several ways we could do it. The easiest way, fastest way, is probably take a rosebud torch, heat this up, and bend it to the, to the angle we need, and then we're done. Quick, fast, in a hurry. Another option, maybe you don't have a rosebud, you don't have a way to bend it. You could come in the back, make your straight line, cut a V-groove in here, and maybe then put it in something clamp it to a truck frame and bend it or you can just cut it we could put it up here i could mark where it needs to go like that little mark and then we could slice that this is a 45 degree cut but that means this angle right here is not 45 if you're going to have two pieces come together when you have two pieces come together it's going to be half and half if you want that miter right in the middle of that joint that's going to be 22 and a half and 22 and a half now down here, there's only one piece that's going to butt down here, so this won't be a 22 and a half. This will be a 45 degree cut down here. So we have to decide which way to do this. You could probably go and have this done in a press break. Take it somewhere, have them put it in a break, and give you that 45 degree angle. I think what we're going to do is cut it. Because the reason being, if you heat this up and bend it, you've lost some of the strength in here because you're actually stretching the metal. You're taking that half inch plate when you heat that up and now you are making it to where you you stretch that metal and right there has become thinner than the rest of it right so you've already you've already compromised the original strength of it so at that point what's it matter we could probably just cut this just as easy and weld it back together and be fine and 
I think that's what I like to do. I think I'm going to cut this 22 and a half, 22 and a half, and put the two together and uh, weld it again. I've got a build coming up uh, for my 4500. I want to build an, a bed for it. So uh, I went ahead and ordered up a new, a new saw to help me build that bed. And I think we can use it on this. So let's go get it. All right, so I ordered this from Evolution. This is their new 14-inch um, miter cutting metal saw. It is just like a wood miter saw. You can turn this thing left or right, and it has a bed plate on it with two clamps to hold it against it and one to hold it down. I thought this might be a uh, perfect opportunity to get some really nice cuts. So it's a 15 amp saw and it's a, a 14 inch blade. What's the count on this blade? 66 teeth. Well, I'd say their packaging is pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, this, wow, that's nice. Look at that. So obviously it takes a minute or two to put together. Table out of here. There we go. Yeah, look at that. Preset angles. We'll go this way. 45. We can go 45 this way and down to. Oh, we go 45 the other way. And you can lock this down too so it can't move. Oh, we got some precision cuts in our future, huh? All right, let's get this assembled. You just slide the head on like this, and then um, there's a cap that goes on the back to stop it from coming off, and two Allen head screws that we'll have to put in and tighten up. There's not a lot to it. I thought there was going to be more assembly. Now, this is the, piv the pin lock. So we just pull this out. This is just a shipping clamp. So now it locks into place. It's still going to move a little. So there's a clamp here. And this clamp takes that movement out. So the purpose of this is not, let's make this clear, it is not to slide into your metal. It is to set the depth of your cut. So if you have something smaller, you're moving your blade closer to the small things. If you have something larger, then you're moving your blade out that way. So very, very cool. So now we're just going to tighten these up. Oh, look, there is an Allen wrench right there. That's probably for the blade, I bet. That's the right yeah, size. Yep, look at that. That's pretty cool. Comes with the Allen screw to assemble it. And it stays stationary. There's a holder for it on the machine, on the saw. I'll show you what I mean here. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, over here, it just sits in this little rubber grommet, and it's holder right there. That's pretty cool. But we'll need that to remove the cover, this part here, to get to the blade. And there's a button we're going to push right here to hold the blade while we get the bolt loose for the blade, for the center of the blade right here. Take this off. So you see the rotation of the blade? It has to go with the rotation of the cut. You see it match up your arrows. Pretty, pretty simple. Not only that, they're not going to print all that on that blade and then have this out. They want you to know it's their evolution, right? 
like I need this plate. There should be a plate on each side of the blade. Like so, see how the, the washer has flat spots in it. Line those up. Now our bolt, it's just a typical standard right hand thread. Hold our button. Make sure she's good and German tight. Good and tight. Take this off. Take that off a little. There's a nut back there apparently for tightening up. Okay, now you can see what I mean by the depth of cut, how far you can go this way. Apparently there, all right, over here, over here is a pin to lock it down. So you can push that over if you need to and keep it closed and then carry it by the handle. So when you want to use it, you just push down slightly, just pull that knob out. And now you have full travel. Get that cord out of there. It's a nice pliable cord. Not a hard plastic one. It's a 14, 14 gauge cable. Yeah. Very good. All right. Nice long cable too, which is nice. We like a nice long cable power cord like this so you don't have to plug into an extension cord. You have enough length to plug into the wall, which is obviously best. This is a hold down. It's meant to go here, but if you look at the back of the fence, you can move this hold down across either side. One here. Like that. That's pretty slick. So you put your material in here, push it against there, lock, and then clamp, clamp it down. These are pipe adapters, offset pipe adapters, so you can slide them on. These have to be apparently more coordinated than me. You put a piece of tubing in there. Same thing here. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. Watch there. I like that a lot too. I am really, really liking this saw. Okay. So they go in here to keep this fence from moving that's what the the grooves in that sensor for if you see it in that tubing you can see here what do you think we get to make our first cuts with this 22 and a half in half inch plate by four really love this this saw so far but i have the same the same i wouldn't say concern but the same thought as I did with my other evolution saws. When you have accessories, it would be really cool to have an accessory holder to put these on because in my life, what will happen with these is I'll lay them somewhere and I'll never remember where they're at. So they won't get used. And I don't think I'm missing anything of where they're supposed to store, but Evolution, if you're watching, that is one improvement I think you could make on all your saws is make a place to hold 
the pipe holder accessories you, that you send with it. I mean, it looks like there's plenty of room in the back. There's lots of places to put it. Because I'm going to lose these. I promise you, a week from now, I'll be looking for these. You guys all got to remind me. I put them right there. So if I can't find them, it's your fault. Well, we're famous for it. I'll put this up so I know where it is. Yeah, I'm going to put this right here so I know right where it's at. And then you remember putting oh. it up, but... Check no. that out. <laughs> Check that out. It's got little spring-loaded balls in there to hold down on it. Hmm. And I like that foot the way that's made. That's pretty nice. So this is uh, obviously knurled. So when you put it in here and you start to put some pressure on it, it pushes on the aluminum and won't let it come out on the aluminum base. I think it's, yeah, it's aluminum. Okay, I think we're assembled. I think we're ready to uh, make some cuts. What do you think? Let's get to it. There's 45, because our bottom one's going to be 45. Our bottom cut. cut and that nice cut is gonna be right there look at god look at that what a beauty we're gonna like that ain't we i saw this i saw this saw on their website and it was 849 now you know we're gonna be building a bed for the 4500 here before too long and uh man that's nice there's going to be a lot of saw, a lot of mitered cuts and a lot of angles. So I figured it was probably make my life a little bit easier. Okay, so we're going to go 45 here. Mark it. And my mark is close. Go right there. Right there. It's 22 and a half. Now we're going 22 and a half. Lock down the blade. And get right, right there. I want to move this as close to the cut as possible. You know, here's another thing. These don't have to be one on either side. We can very easily use both of them on one side, which would definitely help hold your material. Because when you're cutting a miter, the worst thing that can happen in your cut is it creeps. If your metal creeps, then your miter cut is crooked, and then nothing lines up, and then it's really, well, what's the sense in miter cutting then? Bring her down, see what it looks like. I think we're good. Ready? Contact.
Man, look at that. That is just beautiful. We're making progress. Those two are done on either side. I've held them down just below, hopefully right where the crown starts on the uh, frame. So the next thing we gotta do is tack weld this in place. I don't have the material for the bottom side of this. I'd like to run a four inch piece of uh, C channel across here, but all I have is either two by four box tubing, which is only eighth inch wall, which is too thin, or four by four box tubing. And four by four box tubing is getting down there pretty low. Standard C channel is gonna be an inch and a half by four. So another inch and a half isn't really a big deal, but when you get into two inch, it's a little more, and then you get into four inch, yeah, it's getting kind of low. So what we're gonna do is get our measurement. And we're gonna make a plate that's gonna come off of here, come out this way and hit this one. We're gonna weld it on top here. We're gonna let it come down and maybe even wrap around. We'll see what kind of material I have. Let it wrap around this cross member. We can weld it all the way around once we're done. But I want to get the measurements here. And a framing square is, you know, a pretty good, a pretty good cho choice here because it tells me I could be about, oh, this is, if you measure, look at the bottom one, it gives you from here out. If you look at the top number, it gives you from here out. So from here, it's hard to read, but I think it's 10 and about 10 and a half would be good that way. And then uh, coming down from the top, our notch will be at... Looks like eight. Yeah, ten and a half by eight. So we can start our template that way and then come underneath it the same way and find out what we need right here. Yeah, that'll work. I wanted to stop just before the roll started on that cross member. That'll be all right. Okay, now we gotta lay out the notch. So I've got it all fitted up and all squared and plumb, ready to go. So since I'm not a welder, uh, I called up Peter Zila, who is the welding god. And I asked him what he thought, what the settings, what procedure. And I kind of had an idea what he was gonna tell me. He's going to tell me that uh, a dual shield process was probably the best for any time we weld to a truck frame. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to set up the machine. Uh, this is the HTP Pro Pulse 220. The first thing we're going to do is go into our settings, which is here. And it's very simple. I got some dirt on the screen here we it's need to clean really off. All right, so we need to get down to... I'm scrolling through here, go slower, easier. This is flux core, 35 thousandths wire, gas less, no gas. The next one down is flux core, 35 thousandths wire with 25% CO2, 75% argon. That's the one we want. All right, now that procedure we're choosing because uh, as Peter has explained to me, the dual shield process um, cools slower, penetrates deep, and it is a weld that is, uh, I, I don't remember the term he uses, but let's, for ignorance sake, let's say it is less brittle. It, is, it will flex a lot more before it fails. So in a, in a truck situation, we're welding to a truck frame or hitch or something, this is what we're going to use. So that requires a couple things. Flux core wire. And... That's our flux core wire. We use 35 thousandths, and then the gas is 75, 25, just like you'd use on a traditional short circuit MIG. And we're gonna use the chart that Peter has sent us to set this up. As you can see here, this is the wire we're using, the E71T-1M. Now, this is new to me. I just learned this recently, but that's 71. Has some has a kind of a rating for your tensile strength, so seventy one thousandths maybe. Again, I'm just learning about this stuff because I'm not a welder. So, this is what we're using. This is D uh, DC electrode positive. So that means we're setting setting up the machine as a DC a DC electric. The electrode is set up as positive. We're using a 7525 mix of gas. 
and our shielding gas flow rate should be between 40 and 50. 35 thousandths wire and the chart will go across here and show you what the ideal setting or start setting might be 475 inches per minute for quarter inch ours is half 26 and a half volts so we need to be above 475 inches per minute and we need to set our regulator so our regulator as you can see here I'm just a little on the higher side right now and let's see where we're at for inches per minute on the machine we're at 255 so we'll take that north of 450 we'll probably start out right about 500 and we'll see how it does there go from there and there's a lot more adjustments in this machine however i'm not going to change them i'm not a welder uh, I look for direction before I make these changes because we have access to it. If you would like to have access to learning more about welding procedures, Peter Zila has an excellent welding channel, and I'll link it in the description. I'll put it right here. And you can go to his channel, and you can watch a lot of his videos and pick up a lot of great tips and information on welding. So this is where we're going to start and uh, see how it goes from there, and we'll make some adjustments we need to. So I'm going to do a little weld on either side. I'm going to do a little space on here, and I'll come over here, do this side, and I'll come back over here and do this side, pulling the heat away from each one. So I'll start, I'm going to start here, work this way, let this cool, then I'll go over here and work this way from here towards there, let that cool, and then I'll come back over here and work this way towards where I started on the last weld. that nice even line that makes me happy so I have a habit of uh, getting really close to what I'm welding with the with the tip of the welder and uh, apparently in this process that is not what you want you want a little farther stick out than than a traditional short circuit MIG so that's something I struggle with I don't know why that's so satisfying, but it is. So you see I was having troubles here. It just didn't seem to want to work quite right. And I knew I've done something wrong So uh, because I could get it to go smooth, but then the next time it just wouldn't. So I made a phone call to Peter, and he asked me what the first thing he said to me was this. Did you change back the roller in the wire feed? for this flux core wire and I didn't. I was still on the smooth roller and I needed to change to the knurled roller because it needs a knurled roller to push this wire. Once I did that, my results got a lot better. Now that that's all handled, the next thing we have to do is I need this bottom plate. We're going to put a piece of C-channel down here, and I don't have it, so I have to go get it.
I say all the time that I'm not a welder, and I'm going to prove it to you right here. I cause myself so many problems because of my inexperience. It is what it is. You got to learn as you go, I guess. So when we were doing this backbone, my thought was we need this here because when we have our pinnel hook on here and you're pulling something, it's going to want to pull on this all the time. So I want to tie it into that cross member, and I want to do the best weld I could. So we did on the welding table. As I'm laying this in here, I overlooked one very, very important detail. And that's the fact that if you lay a heavy weld here and a heavy weld here, as that heavy weld starts to cool, it's going to contract. When it contracts, it's going to pull. If you have one on either side of there, it's going to pull this side this way. And it's going to pull this side this way, giving us exactly what we have now. If you see this, let's see if I can get this straight where you can see it. You can see where the, where the plate comes up like this and back down. So before I started talking with Peter about welding and learning stuff, uh, my tendency would have been to do whatever I had to to straighten this. Well, now I understand that if I try and press, press this straight or something, I'm going to stress my welds. Um, I probably would have beforehand, before knowing Peter, I would have tried to uh, weld a nut on here, put a larger nut on here, run a bolt through it, and try and draw these two together. But now I understand that by drawing that together and holding it and then welding it, I'm putting that weld under stress. So it already has stress without a load on it. So the likeness it could fail is extremely, it's much higher than before. And we know it's pulled a little bit because I, I know I purposely left a gap down here, um, but it's a little wider. So in order to fix all this, all I'm going to do is live with it because we're just over an eighth inch right in this area. And we can live with that. But I'm going to lay my vertical weld in here first before I do any horizontals. And that will, as it cools on either side of that, it's going to pull a little bit naturally. And we're going to let that go. And that's going to be all we do. I am going to cut this 45 right here because I don't like this big corner here. It's kind of unnecessary. So we're going to get that cut off. And then we'll weld these in on either side. And we'll do this next and see how we end up. So I've laid out all my holes for the pinnel hook. So now we're going to drill some 9 16 holes in our plate. need to adjust this. I got it too high. I can't go all the way through. So This could probably use a little tightening because it won't stay anywhere where you put it. Wipe this all down. I don't want any metal chips going underneath my magnet. Telling you the adjustment on this, this is so easy. That is all the pinnel hook holes. Now we have to lay out for our seven pin trailer light connector. That's, not, that's next. I've laid out for my seven pin. 
Now we're going to see if the evolution saw can cut a two inch hole. I think it's only rated for inch and five eighths. So we might be pushing the limit here. Look at that. How nice of a hole did it make? Let's get this cleaned up and see. Only problem I really had was a uh, bit started to vibrate, vibrate loose. Uh, the actual carriage, that is, not the bit. The adjustment on the travel. Shoot. Ain't nothing wrong with that hole. That's a daisy if you ever saw one. That'll be all right. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Oh, that's nice. Nice snug fit. Okay, now I just got to square it up. Square it up and mark the holes. This is a transfer punch, so the outside diameter, there's a whole set of them, they're different diameters, and they have a center punch in the center of every one of them. All right, we square it off here. Pick the one that fits the hole. these out the quarter inch and use just a regular hex head bolt instead of a machine screw so let's change this over to the drill chuck and we might also drill these with that too Okay, now I just need to take this out and drill these holes to quarter inch because they're not, they're machined, they're like a 1032. That'll do, pig. That'll do. Well, it's not my finest work, but uh, I think it's going to be okay. I need to take the needle scaler still and get some of the slag off that's still on it, but I think it's okay. Uh, I'm very pleased with how my bow came out. I, I just laid that weld in there, that vertical on either side, and let it cool and came back, and it was all but just that little bit that was showing up. You could still see it. I think you can still see it. I can see it, so I'm assuming you can. After it cooled, I went ahead and welded everything else in, and it came out okay. Uh, I did the backside first so I could set the machine because I was, you know, adjust it, fine-tune, and do my best. This was probably the best I got out of all of it, and I, I don't know that I would say it's great, but uh, this one was not so bad either, but it is what it is. It'll be all right. So the next thing I need to do is I have to decide if I'm going to weld this in or not. I... 
my fear is that if I do, it's just going to look awful. Um, I'm not sure. And I have to get lights on the back. I need stop, uh, stop, turn, tail, and backup, and a corner light on here. So um, I was going to drill a couple holes, get me a mechanical fastener to back up my welds, but I got to tell you, I think there's so many welds on this thing that um, if all of that fails, you better just park the truck. <laughs> I mean, good Lord, there's a lot of welds on here. But I'm happy with the layout. I like the positioning of the D-rings. I like where the 7-pin is. I like the, the the receiver tube that low, the, the height. I've measured this frame off another one, and that's what I was working off of, off of what was a standard uh, frame height. So it should be good. But now I need to build my light boxes, which I've already done. I'll probably just hold off on that for the next video. The next video, we'll get the light boxes on, get all the wiring done, and get all of this uh, cleaned up and painted. So I hope you guys enjoyed this, and thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.